Welcome to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com, dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. Serving leaders, managers, and people who will be, helping you reach excellence in your work and achieve your personal goals at the same time. Sign up for the free course at clearandopen.com. And that's where the left brainness comes in. Well, let's take a look at the scorecard. Let's take a look at our current need today and where we want to go as a company in two, three, four years. Are they going to grow with us? That's the opportunity. Hopefully that job description from there, we've pulled out those skills and that's how we're going to rate them. Hi, it's Joseph. And thanks for tuning in to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com. This week, Matt Niblock returns with more hiring and recruiting insight. We'll walk through the early stages of the hiring process, touch on some common mistakes that people make along the way when hiring managers should push back against applicants, and how the idea of gut meets data that we discussed last week can be applied in practice. And listen up, the 2020 and 2021 Clear and Open academic year is about to begin with the fall course, Money from burden to freedom. Of all the realms of business and personal management, money holds the greatest opportunity for change for a deceptively simple reason, because it's easy. Money is easier than marketing, sales, operations, customer service, and it's far easier than leadership and management. In fact, if you completed the eighth grade, you have all the math skills you need to manage money. You need only the barest critical thinking skills, and you don't even need much time. Finance, quite simply, is one of the most rudimentary aspects of human existence. Well, if this is true, then why are we so bad at it as a culture? Well, people have problems with money for the same reasons they have issues with God, sex, and power. They have distorted beliefs and assumptions that cause them to behave irrationally and immaturely. Everyone begins, in my experience, with a messed up relationship with money. Everyone. Money in its most basic form is just a symbol of value and nothing else. It's squeaky clean and far from being the root of any evil, but the wounded ego in us changes it into something else. We project onto money our deepest insecurities and then make a mess of it. I've wanted to do a course on money for a long time and it's finally happening. Money from burden to freedom begins September 24th, 2020 at 11.15 a.m. Pacific time. The content of the course is practical, proven methods for managing money, which we will use to find your problematic relationships with it. In other words, I'm going to give you things to do, and when you have trouble, we'll find out what's in the way on a psycho-spiritual level. For more information on this and to register, go to clearandopen.com slash money. Again, clearandopen.com slash money. Okay, thanks so much for listening. Let's start the show. But I love, love, love that you brought up the acute stress response, fight or flight. And there's two others that I like to, um, that are part of my courses and stuff, because one of them is particularly important. It's fight, flight, freeze, or most importantly, appease. And appeasing. Yeah. They're super cool. Fight, flight, freeze, or appease. And the freezing and appeasing is mostly what you see in the workplace because fighting, of course, is not appropriate. People know better. Uh, People leaving the room suddenly, they know better than that. But the shutdown, that's freeze. That can happen. People can kind of energetically become less forthcoming and more monosyllabic and, you know, all that. That can be a freeze thing. Or what I see all the time with managers is like, I, we, I talked for that, with that employee for an hour about what they were supposed to do, and then they didn't do it. Oh, well, you were getting appeased. You got lip service. Yes. Because telling is not teaching. So they just nodded their head, nodded their head, basically to get you to go away. And then they did what they really wanted to do and thought was the right thing. So what I hear you saying is, be careful not to trigger the acute stress response but I definitely like to go near it. Maybe that's just me, but I like to go near it because I want to see what they do under stress in an interview. Because the last thing I think you want to find out, you don't want to find that out six months later. What do you think about that? Yes. No, this is just a style difference. 
And Mm -hmm. I I don't think there's a right answer. Um, I think I am able to unearth that through honesty, through their anecdotes. So for Uh instance, and this is, I feel justified and authentic doing this. I don't feel like I'm trying to play some sort of mind game. But once you're having a relaxed conversation with someone, wouldn't you rather hear about some of the skeletons of their past, some of the mistakes they've made? Yeah. Really really honestly. Mm -hmm. And when you get people speaking about that, they will tell you about high pressure situations in which they didn't do well. They'll tell you about, and you will see a pattern. And in the end, you're not trying to deceive them into honesty, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to benefit. So if that's one of the key characteristics, let's go back to the project manager hypothetical. Yeah. If that's one of the key characteristics, like if you, if I can flesh that out through them saying, Hey, you know what? I was at this ABC company and the customer was crazy. And then all of a sudden there's another one. And Oh, well, I left there. People, people don't get into that unless you're really getting them into an honest mode and they're Mm. coming out, right? They're going to share those experiences. How do you do that though? How do you get them into that honest mode? I'm sure people would want to know. Um, That's a very subtle, soft skill for a lot of people. It is. Well, uh, I'll be honest, a lot of practice. Uh, (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Uh, Like I tell my clients, you know, you have to be willing to do it badly for a while before you learn. Yes, definitely. And I think... um, you know, this is terrible, but because you know we're doing this right now, right? <laughs> people, people love to talk about themselves. It's, it's right, true. that's true. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's it's we're already swimming downstream. That's how I always figure an interview. People show up, and they certainly want to talk about the good stuff. But you can you can open it up and give them a safe space, right? And say, like, so for instance, if you want to know how they're doing, if, if you want to know what their resilience is like, if you want to know how they deal with um, difficult situations, you can, so for instance, I might say, oh, you were on that project for 18 months. Man, that's a, that's a long time to be a project manager, 18 months. Mm-hmm. You must have gone through a lot of different iterations. Was it you know what I mean? Uh, like you go in the empathy door. Wow, that must have been hard. Tell me about the hardnesses of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, or I admire them because I will point out things on resumes that impress me. So, for instance, this person had worked for a company that I will not name, <laughs> which is nothing less than a cheese grater. <laughs> like I know this company. Uh-huh. This person somehow worked there for three and a half years. Uh-huh. So I already knew going into it that this person was quasi bulletproof, uh-huh. right? So I, I guess that's one lesson there too, and that is uh, know your industry, know the companies, do some research on the candidates. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think your recruiting department, whoever's doing the pre-screen, should know a little bit about. And um, <clears throat> so empathy is one, and. Again, you, you want to highlight some good areas, but say it in a soft way, very conversationally. Like, it, and, and I'm speaking the truth. I'm like, hey, you know what? That, that must have been really challenging. Mm-hmm. You know, and some people, and I've found, right, there's some math to this that I'll do later. <laughs> the higher you get, right, director, VP, yeah. the better the veneer is. Oh, yeah, sure. The more polished the professional self-image is. Yeah, and the, you can tell the body language. And that's fine. So, for instance, I was able to, in a conversation with a candidate, really get to the point of what we were talking about. Their, they were in marketing, right? And their strength was writing and social media. And I said, um, you know, in the creative process, I know there can be a lot of rejection by the time you get to that final product. Yeah. You know, what, like, how do you sustain that? Like, wow. What, what, a, your, what a caring question. It's beautiful. What are your methods? Mm-hmm. You know, and they talked and eventually it was revealed like that it was actually really wearing them down. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. And, and after the call, I was like, we need to find you another, not my job, but we need to find you another role in life. 
Wow, like they just were so jaded. It wasn't a good role for them anymore. You could hear it. You could hear that they were just looking for a job, not this job. Uh, Yeah. And well, that's, and you just said we got to unpack that a bit because that's super important (laughs) to, uh, I'm sure people want to know how do you determine whether someone's looking for a job versus the job? Because obviously you want someone, you want to hire people who are looking for that job, the job, not just any job. That's a big one. It's the first question I ask, and I ask it the same way. How? Yeah, I say, um, so most of our candidates, just as a, this this is an important step in the, right? Uh Most of the people I talk to are coming through, are applying, right? Or they found us and they're, they're coming through our application. I don't, nowadays, I don't do a lot of recruiting outreach to try to engage people. So this is inbound and they've yeah. submitted their resume. You're doing the first screening call with people? Um, I do a lot of times. Mm-hmm. And sometimes um, like the HR manager, we also have a uh, HR coordinator. They will both do them and sort of train them. And really, it's literally the first thing we ask. And we say, oh, thank you so much for applying. We had a chance to look at your resume. You know, the intention of the calls, I, I really want to make sure you have a better idea about phase two, the role. I will try to get all the questions answered. If you can't, uh, if we can't get to them, you know, I'm available via email. But what I really like to start with is you saw something, right? Either it was in phase two, it was a job description. I know the way people gather information now is not just through a website. It could be our blogs. It uh-huh. could be anything. So I'm clearly setting the table for them, yeah. hopefully, to have a great answer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really, yeah, I saw you guys on this blog. Um, I saw your LinkedIn, this. I went to this conference or I read about the job. Uh, the wrong answer is... I saw yeah, you I on Monster in a search with yeah. 50 other results. <laughs> yeah, just clicked on it. <laughs> that's yeah. so cool because that's good sales. You know, in in sales, I, uh, you know, one sales process I learned um, actually when I when I worked at, at Emeth and e- the Emeth sales script was the first thing you did was because people would read the book Emeth Revisited and they would call Emeth up and they would say I'm Sarah who is the protagonist in that book and the in the sales process one of the first things you do is ask the uh, prospect what was it about the book that really touched you. Because in sales, of course, the idea is that the first thing to happen is there's a kind of emotional response. That's the lead generation moment. There's some connection between the brand of the company or the feeling of the product and something in them. And you want to know what that is because your sales is building on that, right? They've already bought something and you're building on that to take them the rest of the way. And you're doing the same thing in recruiting, which I've never heard before. I love that. Super cool. Well, I think it would be naive to say, like, it's especially the way people get information, right? You know, in this, and it, it's so accessible. Yeah. Uh, and I, we personally think this is a min qual coming in, uh-huh. right? We would hope that you, at the very least, looked at our website and know a little bit about it, right? Eventually, as we get through the interview, people can recover from that. Um, but the best answers are because what you really want, uh, I see two things. One, I want to know what pre-work they've done and how they think they align. Yeah. Right. Make uh, you make them articulate that. Yes. Um, because we do take times on our job descriptions. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, yeah. And just to insert here, I mean, it's sort of obvious, but I still see the mistake happen a lot where, I mean, this is one of the most basic things, but it does happen quite often where the interviewer is trying to sell the job to the candidate. And then they'll say, you know, our values are X, Y, and Z. How do you feel about those values? Or, you know, we really think this, (laughs) I know it's, it's laughable, but it's really common. I work with a lot of small businesses. Larger businesses generally have figured this kind of thing out and they've stopped it. But with businesses of less than 25, 50 employees, even 100, sometimes they're still in a selling the job mode and then they're, they're giving the answers to the candidate that they want to hear. And this is a really good example of how to reverse that. So, you know, what is it that moved you to the, you and I talking right now? How did you get here? 
Yeah, and I and I know it, it. I make it seem like there's a line of people lining. You know what I mean? No, it, it, we don't have that ultimate luxury. We're not Google, right? Who has really? Uh, they have made adjustments, but historically, they don't have a great industry reputation as far as candidate experience. Yeah, yeah, I know. You know, but. It, and, and I do understand why I think some recruiters, why managers um, for smaller companies may feel the need to try to sell or fill in the blanks. It really is a dangerous trap to fall oh, yeah. into, especially when you like somebody. Oh, yeah. You're clicking. And you're like, hey, you know, tell me about a difficult customer. Like, everything's going great. And they go, I've never had that. <laughs> It's like uh, being three beers in at a bar and striking up a conversation with, you know, potential girl or boyfriend, and you're just so excited about getting to the next thing. You're not really listening anymore. You're it's selling so yourself. True. You're selling yourself on the person, and not and that and, is a problem. And in not giving them the opportunity to disqualify themselves, I think that's what people really miss out on. Yes, and that does happen sometimes when you when you feel like you're not getting enough applicants coming in. Mm-hmm. When you're not, and then, you know, that's a separate conversation. You know, mm-hmm. there are a lot of things you can do to effectively market yourself to make sure you're getting a steady stream of applications. But that's a critical principle to mention. Um, you do not want to be in a resume poor situation because if you don't have enough applications, you're going to make hiring mistakes just to stick that in here. We're not, we're talking about hiring rather than recruiting. Not, we're not talking about the marketing thing today, but that's an important principle. Insert. No, totally. And to your point, you know, if you're, if we're thinking about this in the classic funnel in, in the hiring, you know, you do want to make sure that you're, you're holding true to the ratios that you feel are applicable for your company. Mm. So I know uh, my lifetime batting average, right, is 333. Really? Uh, sure. From and that's, that's what it should be. Interview or application to hire or interview to hire? What's that? Ratio? Interview to hire. Okay. Interview. That's pretty good. That's what it should be if you're a recruiter. Uh-huh. I, I would say anything over 50% Anything over 500, let's stay within the batting average metaphor. Right. It's like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> steroids. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Recruiting is there. They're chasing. <laughs> um, but that's what it should be. If you're doing your job on the front end and you're screening properly, again, another conversation, you have three interviews from that should come one hire. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and those are the types of I, you know, I'm gonna say air quotes here. Difficult decisions that you want to put your hiring team in. So right now we have an open position. Our funnel is full. We have our process. In the end, well, it's an executive role, so we might, I might go to four, but really three is a magic number, right? Because you don't want to take too much of the interview team's time. Sure, everyone's got to work. Yep, right. And you want to make sure that in the end. They have a challenging decision to make, a healthy challenge. Like, wow, we got three good candidates, mm. right? Our, our gut is telling us all these great things. And that's where the left brainness comes in. Well, let's take a look at the scorecard. Let's take a look at our current need today and where we want to go as a company in two, three, four years. Are they going to grow with us? That's the opportunity. Yeah. Hopefully that job description from there, we've pulled out those skills and that's how we're going to rate them. And then we have a good old fashioned rumble on a Friday, <laughs> Friday afternoon. But, the, but these are the healthy debates that you want to be in when it comes yeah, to hiring. I like that. Yeah. Two really good candidates or three really good candidates. So out of the three, usually one is, is a okay. And a lot of times it's just sort of down to two, you know, from there it's offer. Thanks for listening to Manage to Engage, the clear and open podcast. Join us next week when you'll be a little bit closer to who you're destined to be. Until then, know that clear and open is dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. If you want to help the show grow, I'd appreciate you leaving a rating and review on iTunes. All you have to do is open the Apple podcast app, view the full description of the episode and click the link to leave a rating and review. 
or you can go to clearandopen.com slash review and it will bring you to the right place. If you're looking for more support on your journey, head over to clearandopen.com for even more tools, articles, and free resources. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now.